So that's the high temperature, for the temperature expansion that we, we want to do. And now, out of this sum, I want to multiply it by itself k times, right? So what I want to do is choose one element of this sum, 
Then choose another element of the sum for the second factor, choose a third element of the sum for the third factor, and do that for the k factors that they're going to be, multiply them, and then sum over all possibilities that I have of choosing the first, the second, the third, and the fourth element, etc. So, this is going to become our initial function is going to turn into. That's the partition function, which is 
is of course, by the way, should we be using the mic? Why would he be using the mic? It doesn't make a difference because, because this presentation will have more interactions, then it's better to use only one microphone. Okay, perfect. So that's the, the partition function that we obtained, and that's what we want to calculate. So before we calculate this, I want to, we, we've got, we have to restrict the amount of graph, the, the types of graphs that we're summing. So a first restriction that one can make is that at for all points in the graph, it is clear that the number of edges, the number of lines that are attached to that point has to be even, which is what we've seen before in the, you know, all the other models that we're treating, right? So this is going to be the number of points of lines that are at this graph, which is just defined as the sum over all edges of the graph that are at P, the number of lines that are at each, at each edge has to be even. And that's simply because of the O and symmetry that this contains, right? So, so if I have a, a, some point which only appears in this product at an even amount of times, when I integrate over that point, that's going to be zero. Um, so that's one of the restrictions that we can make. And, well, carrying on with that restriction, we can now go over to calculate that. So the terms that, that are going to appear and for every graph, so the contribution for every graph, which I'm just going to focus on this part, those are going to be integrations of the form integral beyond the B of S times the product, uh, the only of S, sorry, times the product of the components of S. So the first component, the mu1 component of S, up to the mu1 component of S, which is what's going to happen if I expand this dot product, and then I multiply it with the distributive property on each of the factors. And once I, I, I collect all the bits of one type, and I integrate over those. So that's the type of integral that I'm going to And the way to calculate those integrals, what we're going to do is write this as the derivative respect to this coordinates of some function evaluated at zero. So I'm generating a function where this generating function of x is going to be defined to the integral over the sphere uh, of e to the x times. I, I forgot to make, it some, uh, to make something here. Notice that here this integration is only over the points of the graph because the spins that don't appear in the graph that are going to integrate out to 1 because I have the probability measure, so that's the problem. Um, yeah, so if I choose the generating function, then I can write these types of integrals as the derivatives. It's clearly O S method, right? Because if I perform an O N operation to this X, and then that O N operation is going to be up here, here. But then I can take, it, take its transpose, so it multiplies its min, and the transpose is going to still be an O N operation. Since this measure is O N invariant, then that gives me the same result. So this could clearly only depends on the norm of X. So what I'm going to do is choose X. I'm going to align it in such a way that it lies on the first axis of my Rn. And that, if I do that, then this integral equals the integral over the sphere of e to the norm of s times the norm of the spin is going to be s times the cosine of the angle between the two. And this integral is going to equal the integral over d theta sine theta to the power n minus 2 is e to the norm x s or sine theta divided by the total measure right? so that's one side of erased all the other factors that appear here which don't matter in the integration right so that, that it, the, the way that one uses the metric for the n-dimensional sphere and all of that is 
and then we can expand this exponential so that it's an order, it's a perturbative expansion. And these types of integrals can be done by something called Bessel integrals. That's it. Those are Bessel integrations, so those are products of gamma factors. And once again, those that, that calculation is not in the notes. But the result of it is going to be equal to. So it's going to be equal to. Well, purely when k is uneven, then all these integrations are over 0 to pi. So clearly when k is uneven, cosine is odd around pi halves, so that integral vanishes, so we have to consider even terms. And once I do that, I'll get well, the norm of x times s to the 2k. And what would imagine that if it is a 2k factorial at the bottom, but it's actually a k factorial, we'll cancel with integration to k factorial, 2 to the k. And then a 1 over some combinatorial factor, which I don't remember. Let me just check a little bit what it is. So the combinatorial factor is going to be And then I go in steps of two. So I minus four. That's when I reach n. Well, uh, this is actually only partially true. This is actually from one. And then we get one plus this. What is this r? Uh, sorry, k. I switched notations. <laughs> okay. So. Um, so I want, to, I want to consider the Owen model and the limit as n goes to zero. Of course, the Owen model the limit n goes to zero, uh, like the partition function. If I do it there, then, then everything's going to fail. So I've got to understand a little bit better what the dependencies and the dimensions. But now I have the dimension explicitly in terms of the uh, when calculating the generating functions. So what I want to do is take n goes to zero, but n appears here, right? So if n goes to zero, this is going to blow up. Uh, so the trick to, to, to handling that is make the spin, uh, scale the spin as we scale it. So the, the way that we're going to do it is to fix the magnitude of the spin. So it's fix s to be equal to the square root of that. That's the way that we're going to go around this. Because then, um, so if I do that, then f of x, let's calculate the second term. This one, the second term is expansion, then it's going to be uh, the norm of x squared. And I'm going to get a uh, square root of n to the, the squared, so that's an n, which is going to cancel this. And this term, when, when, when n goes to zero, uh, this becomes one, and then I get a two. Plus something, uh, something, which is going to vanish in the limit as, as, as n goes to zero. So this is, this goes to this, as n goes to the it, It's going to vanish precisely because now the, the spin has, uh, has, a very, it has a large power. And since the spin is going to go faster than this, so it vanishes. Okay, and what is the, the important part of this? That the generating function is quadratic in, in x. Which means that I can at most take two derivatives. If I take more and more than two derivatives, then the generating function vanishes again, right? Which means that the only terms that are going to appear in the expansion are going to be those terms which have only two s's here. Which means that 
every spin in the partition function can only appear at most two times. So let me let me just write down again the partition function. So let G1 of 
to G, uh, let's call it N sub G, be the connected components of G. So this is something that we have done before, but I don't think we, we, we have been uh, explicit about this. Connected components of G. The important part is that this integral is going to factor as a product of intercourse, right? Because uh, if I have two spins that are not connected by an edge, then they're never going to appear here as a dot product, and thus I can factor the integral into just first integrate the first one and separately integrate the second one and just multiply it. So this is going to be a product over a equals one up to n g of the integral the omega, and I only have to integrate over the vertices of the k connected component times the product over the edges of the k connected component of those interactions. So the, the, the point here is that we can treat the connected components separately. Because they never connect. Yeah, exactly. So, so if, for example, if my whole graph was this, so if my whole graph was here, I'm never going to have a term, so this is B and this is Q, I'm never going to have an integration of term on the form SB dot SQ. Right? So, so I can take this integration, then do this integration, and then multiply it. Now, if I have something of this type, then that's it, right? So if at one edge I have two lines, then that's the whole connected component. Because I cannot draw a line from here because that would be three lines. Or I, and I cannot draw a line from here because that would be three lines. So this is a whole connected component. And this is the only connected component which has two lines. So the integral that's going to correspond to this is going to be the omega, so let's call this P and Q, or points P and Q, of SP divided with SQ. How many times? Two times. That's, that's the contribution. And this is going to be the integral, the omega, between Q, of S, and then I get a sum. SP mu, SP mu, SP mu, SQ mu. That's what happens when I factor out this, this multiplication. So this is equal to the sum over all components, all the perfect components. And then when I do the integral over SP, then I get SP mu, SP mu. And when I do the integral over Q, I get SQ mu, SQ mu, which are the same integrals. Once I integrate, the SSR just fails. So I get two integrals of the form integral the omega of S. S means so that's what's going to square. And if mu and mu are different, then this integral has to be it has to be zero. Because our reflection along the mu direction is an O n symmetry. Right? That that belongs to O n. Reflecting over on one Edge. So this guy, that, that symmetry kills it off if mu and mu are different because then I'm going to get a minus one once I do that reflection. However, if they are the same, if mu and mu are the same, then it's very easy to calculate that because if mu and mu are the same, I can do the following trick. So the integral the omega of s of s mu s mu is going to be equal uh, of s mu s mu. It's going to be, it doesn't depend on what mu is by rotational symmetry. So I can just sum, so I can divide by n and sum by n of those terms. Right? And this sum is now the norm of n squared, which is n. Right? So this n is going to factor, is going to cancel this integral. And then I end up with n. 
So what we saw is that this integral is equal to n, but as n goes to zero, then that contribution dies. So those diagrams die. Now I can do exactly the same thing for the other diagrams. And what we're going to see is the data, the data as well. So if I have now a diagram like this one, then the corresponding integral of the form of the of S. And then I need to multiply over every edge um, the interaction by So multiplication over every edge half an hour. Half an hour. So I've got to multiply that interaction with MG equals zero because at every edge I have only one line. And when I do this, well, this is going to be a part of, of factors of, of SE1, SE2 with the same mu, but then in the part of that you have different mu's. But by exactly the same argument, if I have different mu's, the integration will vanish. So I can consider in this product only the, the terms which have the same index for all, for all choices in this product. So that means that this equals the sum. different than P, so, so these two are, are, are different. 
and P doesn't appear in this whole product. So I can first do in the integration over P, right? And once I do the integration over P, I have the integration of a linear number of spins. So by symmetry, that's going to die. The same is true for Q. So GK can be restricted to graphs which contain P and Q. So that's the first notice. Now consider some graph. So, so let me do a drawing. So this is P. So I can have at most two lines at every side, but because I have a, an extra P, that means that two line at most two lines at every side means that at P I have to have one line, and at Q I have to have one line because I need to have an, an odd number of lines at those points because I have an extra term here. So an odd number of lines, an odd number of lines at P means that that this appears an even that is P appears an even number of times in the whole expression. So I need to have at most one line at P, so it will be like this. Now at this point, I, because this point is neither P nor Q, this has to have two lines, so I keep going, I keep going, I keep going, but eventually I have to reach here. So these, are, these types of graphs are going to be self-avoiding walks, which go from P to Q. But I could also have other components of the graph, which are, which are just the same as we already calculated. So what, what is the nice thing about this? That if I have other, other connected components, which are the ones that we calculated before, this integral as before is going to be separated to the product of the contributions of every connected component of the graph. And this connected component vanishes. We already calculated. And this also vanishes. So I only need to, calculate, to, to consider graphs which are connected and which go from P to Q. Thus, the graph that I consider, this GK, uh, is precisely the number of self-avoiding walks which go from P to Q. It's precisely the set of all self-avoiding walks which go from P to Q. And now, if I take one of those self-avoiding walks which go, go, from, go from P to Q, I can calculate this contribution, so I need to calculate this for, the, for those cases. And the idea is that this integral By the same reason as before, it is going to be um, sum. It's going to be the sum from u equals one up to n. Isn't it one? I think. I'm sorry. Isn't it one? Yeah, it's one. How uh, did you say it's so pretty? Because the other condition, the other generating function was x squared over 2, so you take the derivative, you get 1, and you do it for each link, so you get the product of 1s, and that's 1. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so, so it's 1. Yeah, I, I didn't see it so quickly, yeah. So the, this is 1 for every one of the terms, right? Because I have only one uh, line, and, and yeah. So I was going to have. And, and the, the reason why they use, so I'm going to have a sum over minus. But the minus have to be equal to 1 because there's going to be an SP which comes from here, and that SP has to be contracted with 1. So this has to have 1. Now, the lattice and the other point, which is with P, will also appear here, but then that point is also restricted to P1, and that's how the index is conserved throughout the walk. So that integral is going to be equal to 1. Of course, these MPs are all equal to 1. Uh, and then what we obtain out of this uh, propagator is the sum of k equals 0 up to infinity of beta j k times the cardinality of g k, which is the number of random walks with k steps that go from p to q and avoid themselves. So this is the generating function for, for those numbers. What did we see? The, the partition function only contains graphs which are self-avoiding walks which are closed 
and the coordinate and the, the, the propagator for P2Q is precisely for the, the, the generating function for the number of walks which have k steps which go from P to Q and avoid themselves. And that's the duality that there is between the limit of as n goes to zero P one model and uh, the self uh, I have a question because yeah. uh, I expect to have all the formation of my theory inside the partition function of Z. And it is one. And how do you could reconstruct the propagator from this one, for example? Yeah, so so you can. And that's the reason why you why can't? Yeah, I mean it's one, so I cannot differentiate or everything. I mean I'm reconstructing it from the partition function, right? But but I have to do it before, I have to take the limit and goes to zero at the appropriate places. Oh, okay, if, if you didn't take this limit, but your first <coughs> your first statement was wrong. You cannot have all the information to do from a moment to the No, that's just not true at all. So that was what comes next. Yeah, it doesn't end with partition function. With a proper source, yeah. just the way that sources. we can uh, yeah, put this on the source. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. maybe I, I can also add the the thing which contains the statistical information of a theory is the probability measure that it's on the on its face width, right? And the partition function is just the mass of that probability. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't have a source, so you cannot uh, put the yeah, it's not partition function. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 Count the number of closed top avoiding nodes. So the number of closed, I, 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 I didn't have to, to count it when, when I was doing the, the partition function because all of those were zero. But then I guess that a way to, 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 to do that would be to consider, I mean, you could, with an arbitrary, uh, calculate the, the, the propagator from SP1 to SP1. Differentiate that with respect to beta j, right? And well, different. It depends on, on, on what the length that I want. So if I want to calculate the number of uh, self-avoiding walks which goes from p to p with k lengths, then I then I differentiate with beta j, with respect to beta j k times, and and then I take the limit as n goes to zero. That's I think that's kind of the, the, the that's kind of the, the the teaching from this step. Uh, you, if you can do the, the calculation for the ON model, then do it for the ON model and with the restrictions that the limit as n goes to zero and everything entails. And at the end, you put the limit. Can you repeat the calculation of the two point integral that you said gave n? Can you do it a little bit slower? You said you have one gram times some per mu or some integral that gives n. Can you just do that step? Oh, you mean the 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 calculators? Yes. Okay. So this is independent of mu because I uh, the, I can rotate the axis. Yes. So I can express the centripetal as this. This, I can re express it as the sum of the same integral and time. Right? So what happened? What, what, what happened? There was one grand, and then that n means some or new? Uh, oh, okay, okay, okay. What happened was that I trained this sum of the side. That's my thing. Okay, and now? And now, this equals 1 over n, the integral, the omega of s. By square, right? Or I bring that, bring the sum inside, and that square I had fixed. It. I had the magnitude of s to be fixed at the square root of n. So the magnitude of s squared is going to be n. Contribution.
contribution of maybe I wrote them, but what, what I meant is for the contribution of if I, if I, of a graph which is between two points. This type of graph. So then comes next because it's a further sum over the top. Exactly. Yeah, but the way you wrote it, yeah. Uh, I have written an end. You wrote an end. Uh, yeah, I yeah. wanted it. It was one. It was one. So in the in the notes that, that I wrote down, Do they, I don't remember people rescaling gas price for the event. Is this something standard or are you doing it? I think, I, I think it's pretty standard, but maybe at least doesn't. It's just that they don't rescale. Uh, they uh, at the at the very beginning they say I'm going to take spins with magnitude n, and I didn't understand why they did that, so I did the calculation without restricting s. And then I saw that it was so that the generating function would explode. Maybe Cardi maybe doesn't do it, but because Cardi takes a whole other approach, which is I don't know if you can call it the Owen model. Because what he does is that he just simply takes another Hamiltonian. He takes another Hamiltonian, which is not spherical, it's another thing. And that way he avoids you have to do the spherical integrations in particular. He avoids the geometry property of the generating function. I'm just confused. What's the physical meaning of the divergence one over n that you found at some point? You had a one over n. Uh -huh. That divergence. Yeah. What's the meaning of that? So why are things sudden for divergent? You can normally I think that I have one over n, but I have x squared multiplying one over n, right? And then I take two derivatives of x squared, I get n, right? Because if you take one plus of x squared, you measure the dimension, right? If you take one derivative, you get uh, you get delta mu nu, delta mu nu, it's contract, you get measure n. So I would imagine you take two derivatives and cancel that n, and I think they're fine and they are good. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought before. So two derivatives? Yeah, if you take the mu d mu of x squared, you get dimension space time, right? Do you agree? Yeah. You get the first derivative, you use the delta. But, and, and, and it's going to appear with a higher power, maybe? Uh, maybe I can write again the. So if you take d mu d mu of x mu x mu, you get n. Do we give it? Dimu, dimu, x mu, x mu. Okay, that's it. That's it, right? Do you agree? Can I calculate it? I cannot do the like so frequently. So, so if I take dimu, dimu, of x mu, x mu. Let's not do the same thing. Just because that hurts. Mu is good, but they can't do it. It's repeated. That hurts. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna calculate that, right? So this is two n. This is two. But the but the, the the generating function at that order at x mu x mu came with a came with a one over n with a with a one over n but there were also n's here right. Oh, but there's no other factors of finite, so it's okay. Yeah. Uh, those yeah. other factors were fine. So okay. so it's what one over n. And that one over n I'm seeing. I take two derivatives. I get an n that cancels the one over n. And that's why I thought okay. So for two particles, I get a finite result. But if you have more x's, you still just have a one random downstairs. But you will take more of the because you get more powers of n. And that's how you would explain that 4, 6, 8, the whole bench. Okay. With this type of argument, you are not rescaling things. You are just saying that uh, x to the power of n comes by summing over the number of indices and they give x the suppression to n. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so, so, yeah, that's right, I didn't think about it. You have to take the limit, I mean, you can take the limit once you've calculated the derivatives. Yeah, that, that's the point. Right? Yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay. So I think, and I'm not sure, that if you don't rescale, the partition function is not one, but is the sum of the closed stuff of one in Okay. Because now, each time you have a loop, it's true that you get 1 over n, but you multiply by n, you get 1, and you just get 1 for the closed loop. But if you have an intersection, then you have 4 guys there, then it will be proportional to n squared. And uh, 
and program that will be a So I think if you don't rescale, then partition file is not one, it's the sum of closed loops. Then what you would do to compute if you want a single one, you would not choose the component to be one, but would really do the dot product between the two. Because it's the dot product as an extra power factor of n, right? Because uh, it's not one component, it's n components, so it's just n times that. But because you did not rescale, you get the same result. Okay, yeah. I just think it's if the goal is to get some of walls from one point to the other, what you did is the best because you kill the partition function and it becomes boring, but this guy remains. But if the goal is to have something more like an analogy, if you want to study statistics of polymers that are closed and so on, I think, I think, but I would like to check that, I think it's best to just not rescale, just take n to zero. Then yeah. those loops would survive. When computing this expectation, however, they cancel, right? Because it's this, plus the disconnected components, divided by the disconnected components, they just cancel, but the paths will still remain. Yeah. Can you, please, for next time, check this. Yeah, yeah, I can check it. The, the, there will be something interesting, however, that, that we haven't in the counting of the closed loops, which is that the contribution that comes from a closed loop of this form and a contribution that comes from a closed loop which is of this form, which has more than one than two points, have different weights. So this has weight one or two, and this has weight one. So uh, I don't know why, why, why there would be uh, that asymmetry. Okay, fine. So those very small loops give a slightly weird factor that it's true. Yeah, because of the, the one over G A from the Although I'm not sure. Uh, we should check. It's possible that the Yeah, the other ones would be okay. The other ones would be able to. You could argue. S squared. It's probably orientation. It's probably. The other ones have two orientations, and this one should go up, down, and there's no orientation. Uh, yeah, so, so we can say that, the, that every code's loop has one half of S squared for every orientation. If uh, we don't rescale less, then Z is sum of closed loops, 
and if instead of taking first component to take scalar product and SQ with SQ, you will get the same thing. Great. But then we have a, it would be a more direct counterpart of what we did in the lecture, right? Where C comes to some of those books, and then correlation function comes out from one point to the other. And then we really have more direct function. But yeah, it's very, very clear, and you went, you were good on that. Okay, so.